Greetings everybody, I trust you're well in these uncertain times. Over the next few minutes, I'll take you through this level six tutorial in general surgery. Okay, um, let's get to this. Uh, for those who I haven't met or taught, my name is Dr. M.A. Magoha. I'm a consultant neurological surgeon and lecturer at the University of Nairobi. The topic that we have for today, according to Brota, is infections of the central nervous system. And after this short presentation, we'll have a discussion after. Thank you. Okay, firstly, we need to go over the scope of infections of the central nervous system. Undoubtedly, as you know, infections of the central nervous system are quite wide and vast, and we can't do it justice in such a short time frame. So given that this is a surgical level six uh, presentation, I opted to focus on brain abscesses. So that'll be what we'll discuss today. But worry not, I'm sure you've seen the meningitides uh, multiple of times. You've seen them in your pediatrics lectures. You've seen them in your internal medicine lectures. So we're not missing anything. The encephalitides, you undoubtedly saw them over the same rotations and also through your, micro your microbiology lecture. First, before we continue, um, I like to call this the pyramid of knowledge. So the pyramid of knowledge ensures how you can become a good clinician like this lady over here who seems to really love medicine. So the first thing is patients don't come with labels on their head. The first thing, which is one of the cornerstones of management, is clinical presentation. To make it as simple as possible, you need to understand that when the patient presents, they are presenting with a neurological illness, and that's what's important for them. If you can identify that, then you are onwards to becoming a safe uh, surgeon. Next, after having an inkling of how the patient has presented and you think it's focusing on the central nervous system, next you have to convince yourself that indeed you're what you are what you're investigating is true and these investigations can be either lab investigations or imaging investigations which we'll go through and then uh, undoubtedly one of the pillars of management is right here in the middle or would be what to do but one of the pillars in the pyramid of knowledge is management and you need to know what to do because that's the reason why you're here and knowing what to do is how to be safe after you've convinced yourself and then after you've done something and managed the patient what would the outcome be Outcome is extremely important because you need to know, one, what will happen to the patient if you did nothing? That would be the natural history of the disease. Two, what will happen to the patient if you partially treated the patient? And three, what happens to the patient even though you treated the patient well? They can still all get complications. Aside from that, when you come to infectious disease, etiology of the infection is extremely important. After that, you need to know the microbiological organisms and how different organisms can cause disease, and that will be pathogenesis. And the incidence, which would be right at the peak of knowledge, is it's nice to know. It's not something that you need to know. So at the bottom, this you must know to manage your patient. This you need to know to be a better clinician. These are nice to know that ensure full understanding of the disease. The next thing I want us to do before we continue is I need the students to avoid what I call dyslexic CPR. This is the type of student who keeps reading the textbook time and time again and keeps throwing information at the lecturer or the patient or the teachers. This is how you look like you're presenting. You're saying words, but they're not in order and there's no understanding of the disease pathology. All right. From that, one of the cornerstones in understanding any surgical disease is defining. If we can define what we're managing, then we're one step closer to knowing what to do. And the standard definition for brain abscess is a focal collection of pus, which occurs within the brain parenchyma. Now, I need you to visualize this before we keep on going. This is a case, I, if I remember correctly, it's a 12-year-old who presented with recurrent superitis otitis media and then presented with headaches and neurologic deficit. And uh, a craniotomy was done, which you can see here. As soon as we lift the dura that you can see here, we see a collection of pus, which is the dead white cells and, and debris. And if you can see, this is the brain matter. This focal intracranial suppuration, as I would like to call it, spread from a brain abscess to a subdural empyema, but it's still a natural history of the same disease. The next thing I want you to note is that the pus itself would have a myriad of different bacteria that we see here. Now, we'll start with the incidence of this. It's 1.3 to 400,000. Uh, this is uh, information from the CDC, so these are American numbers. What this tells you is that it's still extremely rare or reported as rare. But uh, being that we live in Kenya, there's increased prevalence in developing countries due to decreased quality of life and antibiotic use. There's a recent incidence, of course, due to the increase of opportunistic uh, infections and immune-compromised patients. 
This is a very rough incident map of case reports. Uh, and what you can see anecdotally is they tend to, they seem to be around the equator or the equatorial belt. And you notice that it is falling within uh, developing countries or developing nations. Uh, and you can see there we have a few hotspots, one of them being in India, uh, in Nigeria, in Kenya, where we are, and in South Africa. Now, etiology. There are four main types of etiology that I'd like us to focus on and to understand. One is uh, contiguous, which is direct extension from the paranasal sinuses. Uh, the paranasal sinuses, I will discuss this in detail later. Next is hematogenous spread. Now, when dealing with hematogenous spread, it, it is true that you can get spread from any peripheral infection, but any infection that tends to happen from the abdomen and below tend not to spread into the CNS, and that's because we have a natural filter in the body. The natural filter would be the heart, the heart and the lungs themselves. So unless there's a shunt by passing the lungs, then most of them tend to seed into the lungs themselves. And indeed, that's also one of the reasons why osteosarcoma metastasis is extremely common with the lungs. Third is post-traumatic, and these you can infer from anywhere else. Any penetrating head injury that can penetrate the skull would result in seeding of bacteria in deep spaces. And now these deep spaces will introduce saprophytic organisms or commensal organisms. Then uh, number four, we have uh, hydrogenic, which I personally think are the worst. This would be post-craniotomy for whichever reason, would result in seeding of bacteria. Now, a bit more information on contiguous spread, as I said prior. This is from the paranasal sinuses. We have the maxillary sinus, the frontal sinus, the ethmoidal sinus. Now, all of these are direct extension. And from the paranasal sinuses, you tend to see all of these abscesses in the frontal lobe. And uh, for the middle ear and mastoid, these abscesses tend to be in the temporal lobe and the cerebellum. These are characterized by solitary, superficially located abscesses. And they can spread by two ways. Either directly, they brute force themselves through the epithelia and the bone, and of course that would be with more hardy and virulent bacteria, or through the veins. These would be more sneaky bacteria which can which cause thrombophlebitis of the diploic veins. And as we're aware, all veins of the head and neck are valveless, which allow, allow bidirectional flow. Now, when it comes to hematogenous spread, uh, hematogenous dissemination of the organisms will be, come from a remote site of infection, as I said prior. And you can see the bacteria here enjoying its nice quick ride within the bloodstream. These abscesses tend to be multiple and deeply located and would be at the gray white matter junction where a micro infarction of the blood brain barrier would damage the blood brain barrier and allow the bacteria to seed inside. As I said prior, you should note that one of the most co uh, common things, if I see a patient who has something like a cellulitis, lower limb infection, or pyomyositis and presents with a brain abscess, the next thing you have to do is you need to examine the cardiovascular system and you need to look for some type of shunt, a BSD or an ASD, and I think I'll elaborate that in the next slide. Now, there are many causes. This is might be a redundant slide, but this is based on information. I got this from up to date because everybody seems to ask. As I said prior, if you have an infection anywhere, remember cardiac output is about 20% to the heart. And of course, that means there's a, about a one in 5% chance that any peripheral infection can go to the brain if there's a are shunned. So you have chronic pulmonary infections. If the lung cannot sieve, then infection will come straight from the lung. Those which are reported are lung abscesses and empyema. And of course, patients with bronchiectasis and cystic fibrosis are more prone to developing lung abscesses and empyema. Now, post procedures like esophageal dilatation or endoscopic sclerosis of viruses, there have been scattered reports of brain abscesses following these patients. Bacterial endocarditis, I think I've said this on multiple times, I won't repeat myself. Skin infections, pelvic infections, and intra-abdominal infections. Now, post-traumatic, uh, this is quite sad and significant. These tend to look really dramatic uh, on clinical presentation. So, of course, these present after penetrating head trauma. May occur years after the trauma, uh, or may occur after a few months. I think the longest I've seen is a young lady who presented to our practice after five years after penetrating head trauma. But indeed, hers was a bit different. Hers was, you would call it iatrogenic, because the plate which was used to reform her, her frontal bone is what broke in and what was exposed. Remember, the brain is an immune privilege site. So if it's not prone to stimulating an immune response, you may not get the abscess at that point. Contaminated bone fragments provide a nidus for infection. 
Now, this is a trigger warning for some, but you're a level six student, so I'm sure you're used to this. This is a gentleman who presented to our facility after being assaulted by his spouse, uh, uh, found in a situation of infidelity. At this point, we have penetrating head injury caused by a slate of stone, which you can see there. And what is more concerning is you notice that the stone is not clean and it's covered by organisms there. And indeed, this patient went on to form gas-forming brain abscesses. This is another patient. Uh, locally, we have the border borders or the bike motorcycle riders. This is a gentleman who was not wearing his helmet uh, whilst riding a border border, and he sustained severe degloving injuries. Although these degloving injuries seem to be quite dramatic and scary, and they are contaminated, what is more significant is if you notice along the path of the superior sagittal suture, right there we seem to have a depressed skull fracture which is impacted with uh, debris. And right under this, slightly to the right, we'll have a superior sagittal sinus. So this would be prone to forming an abscess in about 21 to 35 days. Uh, the other one which is widely reported, though I see it quite rarely, is a basal skull fracture with a contongent CSF leak, meningitis, which can, apologize for the typo there, cause post-traumatic abscesses. As you can see here, if we look very keenly, we can see that there's a disruption in the cortical margin there, and that is evidence of a basal skull fracture. Keep in mind, a CT scan is not needed for diagnosis of a basal skull fracture. A good clinical history is required for that but you can still see it with a higher faith in those that are trained. Next, we'll go to previous craniotomy, and there are three main scenarios in which you can get uh, uh, brain abscess after previous uh, craniotomies. Scenario one, you get introduction of microorganisms at the time of surgery, and I'll show you an image showing that later. Scenario two, uh, these can spread intracranially through the wound, so with pro-surgical technique, or sometimes you just have a wound that is hard to get good skin closure. Then scenario three, sometimes when you're saving bone for things like depressed skull and fractures, the bone flap itself can get infected and introduce a descending infection. Of note, uh, all research shows that most of the causative organisms in previous craniotomy are MRSA, methicillin resistant Streptococcus aureus, and that will give you uh, highly significant dangerous infections. This is to illustrate a point. Now, for all of the Finalists, remember as you observe procedures, um, observe good hygiene and wear your mask properly. That won't be an issue during this uh, period of corona, but for those students who used to come around with their masks around their nose, and you don't even know if you're a carrier of streptococci, you would see that right in here, all through the, in, deep into the brain. This is a corticotomy after a drainage of an abscess, and you can see an abscess right there. And just to illustrate the point, look at all of these natural physiologic barriers. You have the skin over here, you have the temporal muscle over here, you have the bone which has been removed, and then after the bone you have the dura, the matter which has been removed, you have the arachnoid, which is right here shining and glistening, the pyre which you will be able to see by the naked eye, and then of course the cortex, and remember the nine layers of the cortex, all of these have been violated and you've allowed the bacteria to seed there, so you can understand how significant this can be. This is an image I got off the internet which helps illustrate the point. And what the point is, if you do identify a ring-enhancing lesion which you think is an abscess on imaging and you're not sure where the cause could be, just by virtue of the location of the abscess, you could infer the cause and go back and get a good history on the patient. And that's what this is showing. As you can see, a frontal sinusitis, ethmoidal sinusitis, you get a frontal lobe lesion, as we said. In the child that we saw with recurrent otitis media, superentotitis media, you tend to get either a temporal lobe or a cerebellar abscess. Uh, Things from the bloodstream follow the pattern of the MCA, and with that you could get those anywhere around here. Now, remember, as I just said, location of the abscess reflects the primary site of infection and spreads the cerebral cortex. Now, microbiology. The microbiology is vast and distinct, and very many organisms can cause abscess, and we need to get that straight. But what I like to say is you need to sometimes dump things down so that people can remember and don't get overbogged by too much information. And one of the things is, if it's an autogenic or dental infection, you need to keep anaerobic organisms in your mind. And that's because your mouth is full of saliva. And since the mouth is full of saliva, if you have a dirty mouth or we have penetrating head injury, you could seed and grow these anaerobic organisms in your mouth. When it comes to cyanogenic abscesses, at this point, I would like all of you to take a deep breath in. When you take your deep breath, just tell me what bacteria you breathed in. You wouldn't know. 
And these tend to be polymicrobial, and research shows it's Staph aureus and microaerophilic streptococci that are implicated. The next major group is congenital heart disease, and these you get for your streptococcal species. Despite saying this and uh, making it as simple as possible, over the years I still keep getting students asking me uh, that uh, they want that Chai, they want to know which bacteria there is. So there we go here. So this is a summary of the known identified causes and the bacteria that they that they that are implicated. I won't go through all of these here, as you have this uh, PowerPoint lecture for yourselves. You can go through these yourselves. The other um, three main classes would be immune deficiency. So in immune deficiency, you tend to get fungal infections. And as you see in the background here, you have really big hyphae. Normally, uh, fungi are quite large and can be exposed to the immune system very readily. But in, uh, in immune patients with immune deficiency, the fungi might tend to get through the initial reaction and then cause a secondary reaction and cause function of a brain abscess. In things like Toxoplasma gondii, many people are infected with Toxoplasma gondii, but you tend to get a resurgence in immune deficient conditions such as HIV. That's most widely reported. In most of these patients, we tend to get a negative culture. In one in three of them, we tend to get a negative culture. And very many different things have been proposed. The first thing that has been proposed is normally there's been a period of pre-treatment before. Three, the bacteria is already, the abscess is functioning and holding the bacteria in one place so that you don't get a negative culture. And three, just the nature in which we do the blood cultures. By the time you get an abscess, you shouldn't really have a high bacteremia within the blood. So you will, may not, you may get a negative culture in one in three patients. Now, at this point, I want us to go through the pathogenesis and histopathology of brain abscess. Now, there are four main abscess, uh, four main stages for any brain abscess. At the end, I'll use streptococci as a stereotypical example of how in depth it can get. But preceding antibody formation, there needs to be an area of necrosis, which will be seeded by the bacteria here. Now, with stage one, we get what we call early cerebritis. This happens in day one to day three. And this is characterized by uh, necrotic tissue and a local inflammatory response with marked edema. There is no demarcation between the lesion and the surrounding brain, as you can see here. And then we go to stage two. This will be characterized by pus and marked edema, as which you can see from this imaging over here. Now, this will start happening from day three to day five, depending on the causative organism, up to day seven. Now, you start to get early capsule formation. This will happen between day seven to day 14. At this point, this, uh, you will get formation of the capsule from the medial wall because that's where the blood tends to come from. And as you can see here, this would be uh, macrophages or white blood cells which would come and attack the bacteria immediately. As the macrophages might not be able to do this, we have the influence of um, interleukin 1, 6, 8, 12, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. And this will, and uh, interleukin 12 will, interleukin 10 and 12 will call formation, cause formation of cells which look like these, which would be multinucleate giant cells. At the same point, uh, what would be bolstering them would be things like fibroblasts, which would be coming here. Fibroblasts, the aim of the fibroblasts would be to form the capsule and limit the spread of the bacteria there from the medial wall. Now, from day 14 to 21, you will get late capsule formation, which will happen in layers. And as you can see here, the point of the capsule, which normally has two layers, you'd have the white blood cells inside and you'd have the fibroblasts outside forming the abscess, then you have a rim of gliotic tissue. And this is to limit the spread of the bacteria. And now, um, I put this image here because depending at the point at which you find the patient and depending on the clinical features, then you would have one of four things happening. So you'd have stage one, early cerebritis, you just see what looks like edema with no form of demarcation. Stage two, late cerebritis, then you start seeing a bit of demarcation but still widespread edema. Stage 3, which is what I think we tend to catch most of the patients in, you get early capsule formation. And stage 4, late capsule formation. Now, at this point, this might look a, a, a bit daunting, but don't worry, we'll go through it together. So, this is just to show you that in actual practice, every different bacteria has a different form of spread and infection. And, with, and keeping this in mind, uh, it can be quite hard or significant if you try and memorize each and every single bacteria. So, I don't advocate for this unless unless you come back to read for each bacteria. And now I'll show you using Streptococcus what tends to happen. And this is part, uh, pathogenesis of Streptococcus intermediates causing a brain abscess. So you have the blood-brain barrier here, 
And remember the blood-brain barrier is a physiologic barrier, it's not a, an anatomic barrier. And it, what it does is it prevents uh, hydrophobic, you know, hydrophilic things from diffusing into the brain. At this point, we will have this lux S. This lux S is going to be streptococcus, streptococcus intermedius. And with streptococcus intermedius, the, the bacteria, this is one of the virulence factors that we have there. Now, it has a polysaccharide capsule which has been identified as an important virulence factor, if I'm to be correct, and it has different antigens. The polysaccharide capsule in itself is an antigen, and it has surface antigen proteins 1 and 2, which are involved in binding of fibronectin and laminin of the brain tissues. So you'll have this gene product of laxess formed by the bacteria, and it gives biofilm formation, which also causes recruitment of more bacteria. So with that, you'll get hyaluronidase, which, from, as you can tell from its name, will break down hyaluron and form a nutrient source for biofilm, which will decrease the viscosity of ground substances. So this superantigenic protein forms uh, T cells, which proliferate and produce cytokines. Uh, now, that's just one simple, straightforward way, but Streptococcus intermedius also has other virulence factors, if I remember correctly. And um, these virulence factors, which we, we can see in this image here, which are these stimulate T cells to produce cytokines, the same 1, 6, 10, and 12 that we talked about. And these include ATB binding cassettes, fibronectin binding cassettes, and uh, hemolysin and toll like receptor 2. Now, all of these are seen in this image here, but I won't go through all of it. You can look at it, but this is just to know stereotypically that each bacteria will fight in a different way. Now, we'll take a short break, take a deep breath, and now we'll go through clinical features. There used to be a triad of clinical features of brain abscess, but I ignore the triad because Richard shows that it only presents in about 15% of patients. So there's no point trying to convince yourself with 15% of patients. So what we'll do is, generally, how would these patients present? So generally, it'll happen in their first two decade, decades of life. This will be really young patients. All of you are past the first two decades. Next, male children need to seem to be affected more than females. The cause is unknown, but anecdotally, they say, that, they say that young male patients tend to be more adventurous and outgoing, but I think that's a sexist remark in, its, in itself. Now, um, next we must note the immune status of the patient. This is obvious. The lower the immune status of the patient, the more likely they are to get a brain abscess. And now, with infants, this is a slight reminder for you. Remember, infants will present non-specifically. So you could get an increase in head circumference and a bulging anterior fontanelle, sutural diastasis, vomiting, irritability, and seizures. Now, these are the common ones that tend to present in the majority of people from most of the literature. Number one is headache, and I tend not, let's not overthink this. If there's something happening in your head, there's a 9 in 10% chance that you'll have a headache, and that's simple to understand. If it's going and affecting normal homeostasis of the brain, then there'll be a change of level of consciousness, and that's 60% of the time. And if there's something going in your brain, the brain won't work, and more than half the time, and that's focal neurologic deficit. That happens 60% of the time. Then uh, fever. If, I remember the brain is an immune privileged site, but if you have endogenous pyrogens, then you could get um, formation, you could get fever, and that happens one in, in one in two patients. And the same pyrogens can cause nausea and vomiting. Seizure only tends to happen if you have a disruption in cortical function or disruption in cortical in the cortex itself, and indeed the definition of seizure is disordered cortical firing in an epileptogenic focus. So the abscess itself could form the epileptogenic focus. And then you could get papillo edema and meningismus as a function of raised intracranial pressure. The lab investigations, at this point, there's no point memorizing all the lab investigations for every single bacteria. You need to be able to point towards something is going on in the brain. So a full blood count may show you uh, WBCs, which might be normal, or a mild increase, because the function of the abscess is to contain the bacteria within one place. But that being said, you'll get an increased erythrocyte sedimentation rate, more than 90%, because of agglutination of red blood cells. Uh, lumbar puncture is not advised, so you need to, whenever you suspect a patient might have an abscess, you need to make sure that there's no sign of raised intracranial pressure by either doing fundoscopy or by doing a, an emergent CT scan. So we don't do CSF studies anymore as you could cause herniation, especially in large abscesses. Radiologic investigations, let's keep this very simple. As you've seen, the formation of an abscess has four stages, and you reach the fourth stage, you have 
good capsule formation. But during this point, there's increased blood supply going to the brain. That increased blood supply, when you give contrast, will show formation of a contrast ring around. So it's one of the causes of ring enhancement. Uh, that being said, I'm sure you remember the nice mnemonic magic doctor. And all of those are just different forms of abscesses. So what you get very simple is ring enhancement. You should also get multiloculation, uh, multiplicity because each bacteria is fighting at a different time, and presence of gas because of different types of bacteria. Uh, so that will be it. The next thing will be MRI brains, and we'll go through this together. So let's not overthink this. I'll make it as simple as possible. The function of T1 or the time of demagnetization of T1 causes anything with hydrogen to look hypo-intense, and hypo-intense will look as black. So in the necrotic center, you tend to, you will have all of the byproducts inside, and it will be hypo-intense. The capsule will be hyper-intense, and edema will also be hyper-intense. And then the inverse will be true. So when it comes to T2-weighted imaging, anything with hydrogen will be white. So things with hydrogen would be things like edema, swelling, inflammation, or increased blood supply, because you do have water in blood. So you would have a necrotic center which will be hyper-intense. The capsule will be hypo-intense, because the capsule will have mostly fibroblasts, and with the fibroblasts you shouldn't see it lighting up, and the edema will be hypo-intense. Now this is an image showing an abscess in two stages of formation. At stage, this is a stage 2 at D. At this point, you can still see the foreign body simulating the inflammation, and you can see right over here we have this edema, and this edema seems to be vasogenic edema because you can see it's following the gray-white matter junction. Over here on the left, it seems that we have a late capsule formation. You can see a clear, well-defined capsule. Keep in mind, with the CT scan, you will not see this unless you give contrast, so you need to request for a contrasted image. The second thing here, we come and look at this image. This is a T1 weighted image. How do we know it's a T1 weighted image? As you can come and see here, look for anything that should have water or the CSF, and we can see the ventricle is here. Before I go straight to the lesion here, we notice that there are other things. You can't see the gray-white matter junction in this image, and you can see that there is, seems to be displacement of the midline. So this small lesion is causing significant edema. And we can see here with this contrast, you can see that there's picking of contrast right here. So we seem to have a ring-enhancing lesion on the right, uh, prior to occipital lobe. On the left, this will just show you how multiplicity can be. So we have two offending agents. This is most likely from hematogenous spread, as if you look closely, it's following the gray-white matter junction there. And you have two distinct ring-enhancing lesions. This is a T2-weighted image, and what you can see here, in the previous image that we saw, uh, we saw that edema was black, but here in the T2, edema is white. And as we said prior, the fibroblasts don't have lots of water, so you can see the capsule here. And then now we go to a bit on management and antibiotic therapy. So this is mandatory. Anytime you get a patient who's presenting with fever, headache, neck stiffness, it's mandatory that you should give uh, antibiotics. And of course, the nature of the antibiotics depend on the causative organisms. I'll send you a, a handout with a list of causative organisms, and empirical treatment will be dependent on the etiology. And we'll make it as simple as possible. Note if you're targeting aerobic organisms, anaerobic organisms, or if you're targeting both. There's a standard protocol for three um, of three antibiotics if you don't suspect before you get cultures. Now, what can we do surgically? Surgically, we can do a couple of things. We can aspirate. This is important as it helps uh, confirm diagnosis, you remove virulent material and provide an environment for the antibiotics to work because you will have penetrated the fibroblast capsule. This is also good because it provides immediate relief or increased intracranial pressure. There are many ways this can be done. This can be done open or in a stereotactic fashion or via bubble in selected centers locally. The next one is the one where you involve uh, the surgeons. So, we have craniotomy and excision. This is, of course, a choice if you have something big and large causing an abscess, like a bone fragment, or if you have that, if you have a bullet within, and of course, if you have fungal abscess, which would be large, big abscess with extremely thick capsules, and of course, if you have gas-containing abscesses, and gas-containing abscesses, because even with uh, very little bacteria, you can still get a lot of gas produced, and indeed, according to the doctrine of Kelly and Monroe. 
That means you can have a significant increase in intracranial pressure with a decreased bacterial count. The main disadvantage would be technique availability in different centers, and of course, a craniotomy itself has its own mobility risk. So, with that, thank you for your attention during this tutorial. I'll send you more material and there shall be links in the description. If you have any questions that are not answered in the material, you can use my email address here. And um, of course, if you want to, you can get my most recent book available on Amazon Kindle and hardcover, hardcover at the University Library and selected stores. Thank you for your